We are live uh, on the interweb. This is the Next Reels Film Board. I'm Pete Wright. Andy Nelson's out there. Steve Howdy. Sarmento is here. Steve Sarmento is here. And Tommy Handsome is here. Tommy, Hello, is that me, not Tommy Handsome. Thank you. Is that like your, that should be like uh, potentially your wrestling name. Do you ever, do you ever have aspirations <laughs> to become a professional wrestler? A, a dance wrestler. Is there such a because thing? Because you should. <laughs> a dance wrestler. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, wrestling and dance are my two favorite things. So if I could combine those, that would be fantastic. That's a great see. That's the next show, Dancing with the Wrestlers. That is awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, so tonight, why have we've gathered? Uh, we've gathered this uh, uh, auspicious group here today to talk about a, uh, a a kids film, right? Would you? I'd classify this as a family film. A family right. film. Uh, Oz the Great and Powerful. Uh, Disney's Oz the Great and Powerful, starting the ever so handsome James Franco, uh, the delightful Mila Kunis, the impenetrable Rachel Wise, and the um, <laughs> delicious, delicious Michelle Williams, uh, and my best friend Zach Braff uh, from Scrubs. He and I are very close. Zach the monkey. He doesn't. Know oh, that. yeah. Zach the monkey. What a great, what a, I, I like, he, he was probably the best part of this movie. If there was a best part. He yeah. was sometimes <laughs> trying to <leave> it. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Here, I the, like the Tin Man. The judgment begins. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Uh, Oz the Great and Powerful uh, is, uh, let's see, it was written by uh, David Lindsay Abair and Mitchell Kapner. What else have they done, Andy? Mitchell Kapner and David Lindsay Abair. And it's based on, uh, the works, as it said, of Frank L. Baum. Yeah, it, this is is this this is another one that's suggested by. No, it's based on the works, meaning they pulled from. I mean, he's got fourteen novels, I think, in the Oz series, and I don't think very many of the Oz adaptations have actually just been solidly based on one book. Right. They, they pull from like four books, like even the uh, the Return to Oz that came out in the eighties was, I think, based on four books. So. Yeah, so I, did. uh, I say I didn't even see that. I don't even know what that is. That shows how I I am not following the catalog as well as I should. Apparently, apparently not. Apparently not. Mitchell Kapner, one of the writers, is known for uh, the whole nine yards and the whole ten yards, and uh, Romeo Must Die, Day. Oh, Days of Wrath, and Into the Blue Two, The Reef, straight to video. Yes, that's our dear friend Mitchell Kapner. One of the scribes on this, and Din- David Lindsay Abair uh, is—he's uh, been around. He's did done a few animated films. He's probably the one who's bringing more of the kid stuff into it. Robots, Rise of the Guardians, Inkheart, and then there's Rabbit Hole. We talked about him uh, before. Uh, I can't remember on about what Pete, but it was just so strange that all of his films are an- like animated kill films and then there's rabbit there's hole. rabbit hole which was this it, it was um the kid who dies yeah the kid who <laughs> dies not a not a happy and this was the play that he had written too yeah right uh right. he also though he, he's, he's also the frightening thing is he's also listed as announced screenwriter for the remake of poltergeist oh I there are some uh, poltergeist yeah why do they yeah. do this you know come on that movie was great as it was this is the the little tag they have on IMDb, a remake of the 80s horror movie. Now they are back for another haunting. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> I think they should have just skipped and just remade Poltergeist 2. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they could have done some improvements on it. So, <laughs> Oh, goodness. Exactly, because that was a terrible thing that was. <laughs> the only the only thing i remember about that movie and i know we're off on a crazy tangent is it made me never want to drink the worm in tequila because of that little possessed worm that he drank <laughs> that like <laughs> takes him over oh, so you saw it as a child oh yeah <laughs> i said yeah, yeah that's, that was I, actually the first movie I, i'm a huge horror movie fan uh and that was the first movie to give me nightmares like i couldn't sleep after seeing that movie so that that movie holds a special place in my heart i i for me i was uh i was right at uh, like that was my first crush was on carol ann she was my little i was about that age when i saw that movie and i thought she's the cutest thing ever she's gonna be my wife oh, oh. uh okay so yes but they're remaking <laughs> they, they are in fact remaking oh. poltergeist 
Uh, did was there more to add on that uh, poltergeist topic, or are we moving? No, on? no, no. I think that was it. That's just David Lindsay, Baron Mitchell Kapner, who yeah. now have brought us Oz the Great and Powerful. All right. So I hear from the uh, the preemptive uh, sniping that you guys <laughs> maybe didn't like this movie all that much. Well, I I can't speak for everybody else, but Mike and I didn't. I'll speak for Mike because he's not here, and we saw it together. Okay. All right. So tell me, tell me why. You know, I mean. There really wasn't a whole lot about it that worked for me. the The special <laughs> effects, the special effects looked unfinished and just poor. The acting was just bad in every case. Uh, James Franco, in particular, and all of the three uh, witches, I was kind of surprised by. And the story itself was very lackluster. They it was an Oz story. They could have done so much with it, and I felt, and Mike felt that they spent so much time trying to fit it like shoehorn it into uh prequel the prequel mode that they had to fit in oh here's the cowardly lion let's throw him in too and just like all these things that didn't necessarily need to be there and it just they they threw it all in there and it just i don't know it just didn't work for me it felt very kind of flat the whole time hmm. okay Steve, and that was me going in with low expectations. <laughs> yeah, I can So I, our conversation did not help you that much, or maybe it didn't. I, I had I'd seen some some reviews, and I hadn't read them. I just kind of looked at the ratings. I was trying to avoid them, and they were pretty mediocre. And even with that, I still kind of came out feeling pretty, All right. pretty sad. All right, Steve. Well, I saw it in three D. So oh, and that's if... that's a good point, Andy. You saw it in three D too, right? I saw it in 2D. Oh. Oh. Okay. 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 Oh. <laughs> that changes everything. That was going to be, that was oh, like the. Two dimensions. <laughs> that was like the linchpin on my oh, whole my argument. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so I, I went and saw this in 3D with the whole family. Uh, so. Yep. I had, you know, sort of gotten a sense looking at tomato meters and whatnot of sort of where it was was tracking in. I I enjoyed it. I, I I'm not raving about it, but it's nothing where I I I I don't regret seeing it. I don't feel like I wasted my time. I wasn't overly disappointed. Overall, I enjoyed it. Very middling, you know, two and a half, three star film. I'd I'd say hmm. out of. 17. <laughs> no, out, of, out of, you know, like a four-star rating, it's it's in the middle. Okay. It's in the middle. Nothing, like I said, nothing great, but nothing that, you know, I would discourage people from seeing because I think there's quite a bit to enjoy about the film. Well, I look forward to hearing what those things are for sure after okay. Andy's glowing review. Uh, <laughs> Tom? <laughs> um, I want to preface what I'm about to say by I went into this actually pretty – cynical not having read any of the reviews on purpose but a little bit like after being burned by alice in wonderland by tim burton and stuff and the previews that i'd seen it looked maybe it was going to be overblown it looked like it was going to be crazy and i went there i don't have a family uh unlike steve so i went to myself like a real creep uh to a kid's movie um and just as it starts uh a little girl behind me and to the left, uh, she's there with her family. It gets dark and she goes, I'm so excited to see this movie. I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that was, that washed away all of my cynicism. <laughs> that just washed everything away. I was like, oh, right. Okay. This is putting me in a good headspace. Like it's for kids. It's for families. And just hearing her little voice be like, this is my dark night rises. Like it was just so exciting. Um, uh, that being said, I thought that there was, I, I kind of agree more with Steve. I thought there was a lot of magic in it a lot of and i would probably give that to mr ramey uh that there were problems with the script i thought that the lead especially was really difficult for me i did never felt safe in james franco's hands so that made it kind of very uncomfortable for me for a lot of the time uh and then there's a little bit of a I'll go into this maybe later, but i don't know if this is the right word but i also thought that there was a bit of a misogynistic tone to the story 
which is the exact opposite of the original uh, Wizard of Oz. But uh, overall, uh, there was enough magic in there for me that I really enjoyed the experience. And it was only later when I started piecing it apart when I realized uh, that uh, it had a lot of problems. Hmm. All right. Uh, that, was, I, that, was, that was a lot of words. No, no, no. It was good. There were good words right in a row. And uh, I, so I, I went in, I called Andy right after I saw it because uh, I hadn't seen it before him. And I, I, so I found myself walking out and my initial impression of it was, uh, like you said, there was a lot of magic in it. There were some, some elements of it that I thought were really quite uh, beautiful. And I, I think you're right. The, uh, credit mm-hmm. to Sam Raimi. I mean, I, it, you can, you really, I, I, I at least feel the Raiminess of it. Um, and, and there were elements that I felt were really clumsy. And that's why I bring up, uh, you know, Mitch Kapner and David Lindsay Bear, because I think too, the, those are, uh, they, they're script problems. There were problems with the three witches. I, they were, the, 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 the characters were clumsy. And, uh, I, I think particularly between Evanora and Theodora, just a clumsy sort of uh, relationship that I, I didn't quite understand. And, and, um, uh, James Franco was, uh, man, it was, it was just a lead balloon. I mean, I, I couldn't, I, I have a hard time with him anyway, but this movie was, was just, uh, I mean, it was, uh, it, it, it was really painful. Watch every time his mouth moves, I, I find myself throwing up a little bit in the back of my throat. It's just really bad. Um, <laughs> I, I don't usually have a problem with him, but this this was one of those movies where I watched it and I was like, okay, this is what everybody who yeah. who rags on James Franco because he can't act. This is what they're talking about because yeah. it was it was painful to watch him. You know, and it's funny. What's isn't he in the one that's about the end of the world with um, uh, yes? What's his name? And you know what? I watch him playing himself. Anytime you see him in a spoof kind of a thing, where where James Franco is as a guest as James Franco, I find him more interesting, like as a human. Uh, but when he's trying to right. be another character, I I think I, maybe that's a sign of of, of a, not a great actor. I hear he's very smart, but maybe not. This isn't his field. He should be a well, doctor. I like him in 127 hours. I mean, he's he's done some some more. Oh know, yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. Award no, winning was... fair that yeah. that stands out. That you know he he can perform well. Yeah. It's just in certain roles, I just don't think he can take it on quite this, as well as. Uh, yeah, this, this certainly one. wasn't it. I it so I but I realized as I after, as I was thinking about it later that I actually fell asleep it, during this movie. Uh, about halfway through, I think, as they're you know kind of making their way to the Emerald City, I I found myself dozing off, and I think that's not a great sign. And as I'm walking out of the movie, I realize this is a movie I don't really ever want to see again. Also, not a, a great sign, I think. So, <laughs> like, yeah, it, this was the Chinese food movie, you know. I just well, I, and 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 here's the thing. I mean, speaking to both, <laughs> uh, speaking to both Steve and and Tom, I mean, I agree. I, it has a lot of elements that I think a kid would like. That being said, if I took my six-year-old, I think she would have been scared to death of the flying monkey or the flying baboons, really. I mean, because the flying monkey, he's a nice guy. and He's great. But the flying baboons are terrifying. And if you're making a, an Oz movie for the kids, I, I think that it, it seemed like a dark route to go. And well, the seemed, flying monkeys were scary in the original Oz, too. Well, but they're all people. Yeah. There are people dressed like monkeys. It wasn't that yeah. scary. I mean, I know kids still had nightmares and everything, but I, 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 and it was still G rated. And I know that was a 1939 G rating mm-hmm. as opposed to modern day uh, G rating. Well, although this, still, this is PG. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, right. But I mean, as far as modern day, I don't know what the difference was uh, uh, in the rating system between 1939 and 2013 as far as what rep, what a G film was. Yeah. But. I don't know. I mean, I, I just felt like that the for for kids, it it was a weird balance between kind of some frightening moments for maybe you know uh, tweens and moments that were uh, more aimed at younger kids. And I I felt like they kind of were going back and forth. And this definitely goes back to the script. It just didn't seem like they had the balance right, and they couldn't really figure out. Now I've never read. Um, L. Frank Baum's novel, so I don't know if that's how his books are, but that's how the film felt. Right. Okay, so so let's let's go through and talk about some things that we liked that actually worked. Uh, Steve, you said you had a list. 
I, I said I had a list. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you said you had a detailed outline, I think, of the things oh, that, okay. that really worked well for you. Of course I did. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. going to you what Andy... that PowerPoint. It was a PowerPoint. Yes. <laughs> and it all starts with the Yoda Emperor <laughs> duel at the end. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so going back to what Andy <laughs> mentioned that he and Mike talked about, about shoehorning this in as a prequel to make it fit and, and sort of connecting to to Tom and, and the Alice in Wonderland thing, I, let me say, I did not like the Alice in Wonderland. It's like, because it was a sequel, they could, they could take all these different directions that I didn't enjoy. And what I did like about this is, you know, you can see the connections, how they're setting things up. And some of them are quite obvious, you know, they gotta, they've got to fit them in, but there were some nice callbacks to that, to see the connection through, you know, when, uh, and when we're in Kansas and we've got, you know, this woman showing up and, oh, she's going to marry John Gale. And we've got this whole discussion about that. So we see these connections of sort of laying these pieces, connection to a familiar world that were nice. The fact that it was structured, the black and white. I'm, I'm sorry. Can I stop? Oh, yeah. Can I stop you real quick? What was yeah. that? What was the connection when she's talking about meeting someone named Gale? To be honest, I'm not very well versed. I actually oh, have to be that's, completely uh... honest. I've, ne- I've never seen... Uh, the Wizard of Oz the entire way through. Whoa. Oh, that's that's. Oh. I had really. Oh. Oh. I know that's, that's, that's weird. I know that's weird. No, that's that's Dorothy's family name, Dorothy Gale. Well, so, and it's her. It's and that. Her, oh, what so that is that was, maybe Dorothy's her, mother? The, well, possibly. Yeah, I think I mean, it's what it was setting up is that that because huh. she's living with her aunt and uncle in Wizard of Oz, but I think it's sort of possibly this this could be Dorothy's mother. I, that's how exactly. I took it. That's that's how I took it too. I mean, and she's okay, wearing the okay. and she's wearing the, the her, her dress is the same fabric that we see Judy Garland wearing in Wizard of Oz. Wait, and then even, wait, is that gingham? You yes. know, you know it is. You know it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bad writing. Don't yes. get Pete started on gingham. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did enjoy the, you know, we, we start off in, in black and white and we're in, you know, a very squared off aspect ratio. Yeah, and then as great. we get get into Oz and what it was, it was a really nice, subtle transition that is that camera's pulling back. The frame is just slowly, slowly creeping out wider and wider to reveal more of Oz. And then the to me, it seemed like the color was that sort of really oversaturated technicolor, like the reds are really, really red. And it wasn't that way all the way through the film, but at least in that first sequence when he first gets Oz, the color palettes just seem to be echoing that a little bit, which I was like, okay, this is what Oz looks and feels yeah. like. You know, so, I I actually had the same note, Stephen. I, I wonder if I would be very interested to to see if they actually did tone that down over the course of the film. I it or if it was just the the contrast of going from the transition of black and white to that sort of colorful world of Oz. But I, I agree with you. I thought that was one of the most uh, sort of beautiful transitions, and that following ride that uh, I thought was was terrific. Yeah, and the, the, to me, the three D really made that that ride into Oz over the waterfall and all these plants and everything. It, it really brought out that extra dimension and depth to that scene. So it that to me was a really nice introduction to the to the land of Oz. So that that just set this great fantastical world. Um so you know for starters I really enjoyed that that transition introduction to to the world of Oz. So that's that's the first thing on my list but I'll, I'll allow others to step in but that was one of the things that for me set a tone of a fun and adventure for the story okay so what what else did people like tom you you said you liked some things i completely <laughs> agree to be honest with uh steve uh i don't know why i said to you could be, be you could like be honest with all of us yeah um <laughs> you could yeah. be honest with okay. me and andy to be honest with just to be honest, just with you, Pete, Andy, <laughs> this isn't for you. Um, no, uh, just I thought that 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 beginning. I thought that the 3D was fantastic throughout. Uh, I thought it was completely earned. I thought it was great. I haven't seen that many movies in 3D, but it didn't feel like it was just so someone could play paddle ball in front of the camera or any of that kind of nonsense. Uh, from the opening credits alone, when you're going down that tunnel of different. Oh yeah. Um, title cards when the di- when the curtains. I was just mm-hmm. the opening and everything that he said about the idea that when it was uh, the smaller aspect ratio, but then every once in a while they would throw something past the aspect. Oh, that was ratio. nice. Like yes, when the, the strong the, man 
that was really cool. And they only did it yeah. like three or four times, which I thought was restraint. And I thought it was really cool that the whole opening and then going into Oz, that whole thing. I know I'm copying what Steve said, but that gave me so much goodwill that I was having so much fun for a long time. It was only later that I was like, some of this stuff is sort of taking a long time. It's a little <laughs> bit dry. But I was, I thought the opening was fantastic. I just thought it was so magical. I'm I'm feeling a little bit bitter. But unfortunately, now. it made a promise that the movie couldn't take. Yeah, I I'm I'm sort of what? feeling a little bit bitter about the 3D right now because I too saw it in 2D, uh, and because I was I feel like I was so jaded after the last horrible 3D experience, and and so I uh, I saw it in 2D and I felt exactly the opposite. I felt like oh clearly they're just shoehorning all of these you know things that would be obviously uh, 3D gimmicks into this film. <laughs> Uh, you know the the flying sh uh, shards of wood that are shooting through the basket of the uh, uh, of the balloon in the tornado. The you know these things that are flying past it obviously are well, would would have been the flowers in the dark forest seemed the most oh obvious yeah movie. the flowers in the dark forest absolutely you know I felt like those were such obvious gimmicks that I thought ugh, dumb this is why we need to get rid of 3D but maybe <laughs> see now you're telling me I should have seen it in 3D and mm. sucked it up. Totally it earned really all the way through. I, totally. I mean, for yeah, me. yeah, it, 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 I mean, yeah. There's, you know, there's yeah. spears flying out of the screen. There was some snow, and again, maybe it was having kids around me so that when when that snow's coming and I see, you know, out of, out of the periphery to my right, uh, the, the kid sitting next to me, just sort of reaching out towards the snow, and it's like these kids are just so lost in this <laughs> film. And it's like you have to go with them on this ride. And I, you know, at one point, I'm I look off to my left and I see my my youngest daughter just on the edge of her seat, just what's going to happen next. And it just, it's, oh. you know, you, you just <laughs> lose yourself in that and it, it makes it so much fun, but you know, it's staying here in the beginning of the film. The other thing that, you know, to connect with sort of the, wait, can I, can I ask you a question just about what you were saying, Steve? Uh -huh, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. No, no. Okay. Uh, Steve, uh, did you, did you ever duck when the spears were being thrown? Because I did. And I'm like a, I'm a grown man. Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> I that literally was... ducked. I was like, spears, whoa. Whoa. Like, it was really well done. <laughs> it was. It was. That was. It wasn't. Yeah. That is. You. Because. Because Tom and I just lost okay, cool. ourselves in Oz. Oh, that's that's great. No, I feel like I'm talking with children. Right. It's it's yes, that it's yeah. that real to me. No, but in in the beginning, and then of I the went home and I painted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, uh, what are you saying, Steve? Uh, the you know, if we're going to hang around in the beginning of the film here a little bit, the whole sort of you know motif in Oz is sort of the connection between Kansas and this world of Oz, and so you know we have Zach Braff as you know Oz's sort of you know assistant, not friend, but you know partner or whatever, uh, who's you know becomes the voice of the the monkey butler. But uh, the one that I wasn't really expecting to see this this connection through, and it sort of struck me as interesting, was the little girl in the chair, and that that whole scene of, you know, he's you know pulled out this great trick, and then the girl's like, you know, make me walk, and he he can't, and then the callback to that later on when he's in, and I hate that they named it this Chinatown. Yeah, that yeah. was. You know, I, I thought that okay. was such a when I saw the sign, I thought, oh, nice touch. Yeah, I get that yeah. for the grown ups. Totally yeah, not. Exactly. For the but then he, you know, that he fixed, you know, he finds this little doll and he fixes her legs. And it's it's that, you know, I was like, oh, going back to the girl in the chair, the, the one that he couldn't fix. And now, mm -hmm. OK, maybe he's on a path to redemption of fixing all his mistakes. And there's those connections oh across. God, I never even caught that. Yeah. I never caught that. That's awesome. Okay. You know, she, that little girl uh, is Joey King, and she has been around for a long time. If you're a fan of the, as we are, of the fantastic Ramona and Beezus from 2010, <laughs> she was also in The Dark Knight Rises. Uh, she's uh, She's been in, uh, gosh, um, a ton of stuff. Crazy Stupid Love. Ba she was in Battle Los Angeles. I know so many huge fans of that film. Um that was sarcastic, uh, and uh, and so she's been around a long time. I thought she I thought she did a great job. I thought she was very sweet, and um, um, I I particularly liked that part. You may continue. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. I'm I am now I'm now finished. 
<laughs> can we do can we do little footnotes on the internet and just you know totally. whenever pete interrupts no, 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 i'm actually d- don't worry i'm holding up my finger with a one every <laughs> okay, time every go. time i speak <laughs> <laughs> so that that's you know in the in the beginning world that transition to oz those are the things that really made it enjoyable for me that, that i like because it it kept true to the world of oz you know what my expectations were that we've got kansas in this fantastic world there's a connection a character that's bridging the gap and I don't know if anybody else caught this, but it, it, they were in the mountains when he first gets to Oz and later on when they're in the clouds floating in bubbles. Did anybody else notice that there was this distinctive sort of archway or bridge formation that seemed to be a, a, a visual motif throughout the landscapes yeah. and in the clouds? Yeah, it did seem to be. There was always a cloud with kind of a pointy thing sticking out like it was. Yeah, what, like yeah. it was a what? A hat? I didn't notice. Well, it. that's I, I was. I was wondering if it was something like tying us, like hinting at the witch's hat or something, but I don't know. I, I did yeah, notice I, it though. Yeah, it is, it's because it was distinctive enough that it stood out, but there was never any follow through of what, you know, what what it was supposed to mean or reference. I don't know if it was sort of a little, you know, hidden Easter egg for hardcore Oz fans or Sam Raimi fans or something, but it's just something that I, that I noticed uh, huh. visually going through because there's so much to pay attention to you know, sort of visually in this film when we first get there. Um, so the next things I want to talk, you know, that I really liked, you know, I, I'm going to start to get into characters. So I, before we start picking on individual characters, I'm willing to hear what, you know, Tom and I have presented what we liked. I don't know if you guys want to I, let loose with oh. the wrath of, of your bitter, dried up, withered hearts. <laughs> <laughs> I love the new did, Avengers trailer that happened right before it, or the new Iron take, Man trailer. I did take a bite of an apple right before I watched this. Ah, That's awesome. there we go. Andy, you you got to be able to pull something out that you liked <laughs> of this movie. Uh, hmm. I did like the monkey. I did like. <laughs> uh, and, I think it's know, getting I, worse. I, okay, I think it's way, getting worse. I I did like. I will say. And I'm jumping all the way to the end of the film, but I liked how they did tie the wizard, uh, the way that the wizard is able to uh, to stop the witches and the way that he's able to kind of, you know, um, defeat them. I liked how it really tied into the first film as much as I was saying that whole prequel thing earlier. I, I, I enjoyed what they did with the wizard at the end of the film. It actually really made a lot of sense to me and I liked it quite a bit. You know, on that point, I I was worried going into this movie that um this this would be kind of that they would take Oz and thing it, you know, like the the thing prequel to the thing, where it's such a literal prequel that ends, you know, a- at the exact moment the next movie starts. I'm kind of hypersensitive to prequels right now, and I, I but I'm with you. I thought that was part of the str- probably the strongest part of the film was yeah. the cleverness with which a he defeated the evil witches. Um, but B, the way they, I, I thought they tied that, all of the machinery, the mechanism into, um, into the, the, you know, the, the first film. Uh, I liked that a lot. I also really liked the, um, I, I liked the gifts. I thought the gifts at the end the, that he would bestow upon them. I thought they were very, I, that they're gifts that I, I wish I had seen that with my daughter because I think it's, those were, were totally appropriate and really, um, you know they could have could have in a in a different man they could have evoked some man tears yeah i i certainly I not andy like, i know but i i agree i did like that bit too i but that's again tying it into elements of the 1939 the wizard of oz which i i, I enjoyed the way that they that they brought those elements forward and that was it for you that's the only thing you liked pretty much um, I did like China Doll. I, I liked her, or China Girl, whatever her name is. <laughs> that Chinese thing, that Chinese doll that yeah, they had. Yeah. Um, I, I liked her Your character. New fetish. China, That's China, right. China Girl. China Girl. China Girl. I, I liked her character. I liked that element of the story. I always like seeing little things like that in Oz that weren't in The Wizard of Oz. Does it ever make you wonder what happened to the farmers and the tinkers? As far as... Well, like in this movie, we have farmers, tinkers, and munchkins. What and, happened... And quadlings. 
and quad and quadlings, what happened to the others? How did the Munchkins arrive on top? Because uh, I don't remember the Tinkers in the th- in the first movie. It all depends on what land you land in. That's what I remember. Well, oh, so I you're re- saying they got separated? Now we're into Oslor. I I read Wicked, and reading Wicked, it it you have a nice map depicting the whole land and how the north, south, east, and west all have their different people. Oh, okay. So this was what we're seeing is before the great, this is the sort of the the Pangea of of Oz. The lands have yet to be split. Okay. Apparently. All right. So go ahead. What else do you love? Um, I don't know. You can be finished. I mean, that's okay. I did like that it, you know, I liked the black and white four by three aspect ratio at the beginning. And then I liked that they went to the full frame or the, the widescreen <laughs> after that. It's a totally hopeless movie for you. Yeah, it really was. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> you thought the, you thought the end credits were tasteful. <laughs> the, the end credits, they came not as fast as I would have liked them to. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the font the font the was impeccable. Font was, the font was great. The font for the opening credits. I I'm font. I'm going to tell you this. I got to ask you about the uh, soundtrack, and I'm going to say it first. I, I I think it's one of Danny Elfman's best. You know, Danny Elfman and Alice in Wonderland. That was the best thing about Alice in Wonderland. His score for that, I think, is one of his best. And I I completely agree with you, Pete. I I don't know why I, it spaced. I spaced it, but yeah, Danny Elfman. His music was phenomenal for this. I absolutely loved it. It was it was just locked in with the. It moved the story forward. It was uh, emotionally appropriate. I mean, it was and it and it was so catchy. I found myself sort of singing that circus theme over and over and over and over and over again. It was great. Yeah. It really was. It really was. Okay, you should take a break. That's this all. has been this has been hard <laughs> on you. It has. Whew. Uh, okay, so you want to start talking about the characters? Can we talk about? I'm really interested in Steve's comment earlier about the about the uh, uh, this this comment uh, toward misogyny. I uh, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. Oh, it was Tom. It was Tom. Tom. Yeah. Tom. Tom. I, I don't use big words like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and I wonder if that yeah. was if I was misreading the 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 relationships, or if maybe we were seeing the same things and I choose different words. Tell me what you think about that misogynistic can you still hear me okay oh yeah oh it's like you're in my okay. head oh oh <laughs> <laughs> misogynistic might be a little bit strong and i'm trying as much as i can not to compare it to the original because i know it's such that's in the canon of like greatest films can't touch but i do know that in that original that everyone came to dorothy for help that everyone came to the woman character the female character for help with their problems whereas this movie Everyone, whether it be a China doll or these incredibly powerful witches who have like huge supernatural powers, all this stuff, keep coming back to this seemingly unimpressive guy to help solve all of their problems. And I thought that was such a weird way to take it, uh, just because I just felt like everyone was just waiting to be saved by James Franco, by Oscar the entire time. And something about that just stuck in my craw. Stuck in my craw? That's a phrase I use. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I was actually, I was, I was upset about that during the film. I, I wondered about that too. You know, they kept saying over and over that this, this, uh, you know, they're, they're looking to Oscar, uh, because of the prophecy. And, I, I kept I, I kept thinking the same thing you I mean these are women who can shoot lasers out of their fingers uh, they can right. they can do things that no one else can do and we have a guy uh, who comes here and they are putting all of their faith in him based on the, sort of the power of of the power of faith the power of belief and is that the story that we're that that we're really you know trying to tell here that was not the story i got out of the original wizard of oz it was not a story about uh, about sort of uh well i guess it kind of was a story about blind faith and shoes but uh but really it was you know it ended up being a story about sort of taking <laughs> taking your own uh you know taking control of your own destiny and going to the you know and, and succeeding where you thought you could not that's a great new tagline for the wizard of oz 
uh, believe in <laughs> shoes. Bl- blind, belief, b- <laughs> blind faith in, in your shoes. shoes. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe it's a, maybe it's a parallel. But I, I, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. That that stuck in my craw as well. That that I think they, um, there was a little too much of uh, so much of that, um, you know, faith in the clumsy, you know, sleight of hand magician. Uh, that that I just found it kind of not believable. Obviously, that's the movie was not directed at me, so I kind of let that go. But but if, if he had, and a lot of that, unfortunately, I think lies in Mr. Franco's hands. Yeah. If he had been more of a charismatic character, I know we're not going, we're not getting to him yet, so I don't want to go too far. But everyone, all the women, because it really is. I love the idea of a film that is so filled with women. But all of them saw him either as a daddy figure, or I think all of them saw him as a daddy figure or a love figure. Mm-hmm. And they would do anything. Like the reason that the Wicked Witch exists is because she was scorned by James Franco. And like all <laughs> when this you stuff, say it, like, when you say so his much... name, <laughs> when you say it, his name, it's totally unbelievable. At least call him Oscar. Then and it's mildly uh, believable. I, I, I won't because and that's getting into the next point that we'll get into later because it was James Franco. It was, <laughs> it was not the Wizard of Oz. It was just James Franco being like, yeah, and they just used every first take. But <laughs> that's, that's what I think happened. So what you're saying is the movie we really saw was Oz the Mediocre and Mumbling? <laughs> totally. You kind of get the feeling that I, I found myself saying, yeah, you know, like. the Uncomfortable with timing. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like like every cut, you know, every time they, they yell action, he he would always start with "I'm James Franco," and then he would say his line, and they just cut out right. "I'm James Franco" a thousand <laughs> times. Uh, yeah. Okay, all right. I uh, I you know I'm I'm it got, let's go, Steve. You well, had, you want to talk well, about I, character? I just want to follow up on that point though that oh. that Tom was making about the you know the the misogyny and the nature of the story, and I do think it's interesting. I've just been looking at all of the kind of the brief synopses of all the Oz books, not just by Baum, but by everyone else who ended up writing any of these Oz stories. And there was never a prequel in anything that they, that any of them wrote. It was always basically, it was always, wow. it was always from, what is that? It was always I, from, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an echo of the show. Echo Somebody's gone live with us while we're listening. That's right. Is somebody live with us while we're listening? No. Does everybody have headphones on? Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. That's crazy. All right. Well, let's keep so, trying. Yeah. But but in none of these stories did they develop a prequel. And and the whole idea of the prequel, I mean, obviously you need to get the wizard needs to be there. And obviously the witches need to be in place. And so, I don't know. It does feel like the nature of the story and what they wanted to do with it by nature is going to end up shoehorning this whole idea of, hey, we have to have some prophecy that these witches now believe. Because witches, I mean, they are powerful beings. They have these great supernatural powers because they're witches. But because of this prophecy about a wizard coming and saving the land, that is the only thing that really, you know, is kind of keeping these these women characters from being as strong as they, they really should be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that's the that the the only place that takes me is to the power of delusion, right? Um, yeah. Like they they were already super powerful, and they are you know deluded in some way to believe otherwise, right? Which I don't think is the right lesson for the for the story for me. Like I don't feel like I wanted to have walked away having felt that way. You know. No. Yeah, I, I don't think I wanted to walk away that way either. And I don't know. I just I just wonder if if the quest to make a prequel to The Wizard of Oz is really all that it was when they set out to write this story um, as opposed to telling a great story. Um, you know, and I mean, they they could have just as easily pulled one of the 14 books that uh, Baum wrote or one of the many, many um, other Oz books that other people wrote. And they could have made a film out of that, and they could have made a great film. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm i not sure what the need to do a prequel was if, okay. they, if, they, if they felt that, 
I don't know. I guess I, I guess I'm just kind of stuck on that. I just felt like it was such a forced prequel that I, I just had a hard time really enjoying it. Do you guys know if there was a, a rights issue about the books? I mean, it, no, it, they're it, all they're all public domain. All 14 uh, of his original novels are all public domain. Yeah, the only thing that they had rights Hello? issues was was the uh, was the was the Ruby Slippers, which are actually not original to Baum's work, from what I've read. The in the books that they're silver slippers that they right. change them to the red and i think there was something else about the munchkin songs or something like that yeah. that mgm or warner brothers they whatever, have no owned. rights to the ori- right wow you're exactly right they have no rights to the original film yeah interesting uh okay so uh, steve you had things about characters Uh, hold on just a second. I'm going to have to get back to you guys in a second. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. That's all right. We're live. Can, can do. <laughs> uh, okay. So I, I, I had said that I thought that the relationship between the ladies was, uh, convoluted and I'm not sure uh, that I actually saw, uh, the point of, you know, and I don't know, I, I don't know the backstory if there was any other backstory about Theodora and Evanora. I mean, maybe I just missed something, but their whole relationship uh, and Mila Kunis sort of uh, stumbling conversion uh, to evil. Yeah. Yeah. I thought was was uh, was pretty ham handed. Um, I, I that this is another example of that sort of blind faith in now love. Uh, that she ended up being an extremely kind of weak character to to uh, kind of just fall in love based on prophecy, and then when it didn't happen, she uh, sort of falls apart and turns green. Yeah. Uh, did Did you guys feel like these the witches in general were used well? Well, no. I thought that they were. Ve- I thought that they were very bland. As far as I guess, do you mean the performances or the story wise? Well, I'm thinking about the. I, I'm thinking about. Well, yeah, we can talk about performances too. But I'm thinking right now about the story itself. That that there is this. Um, you know, that when you look at the the role of each character to move the story forward. Um, you know, I I felt like in many respects the the witches and the relationships between them uh, held the story back. Uh, I felt that like there were just mm. parts of it that I just thought were move through it, just be done. Uh, I, I yes. wanted like <laughs> I, I I felt like uh, Rachel Wise in the end um, ended up being a, uh, a just sort of a, a waste of screen space. And I lo- I love Rachel Wise. I really yeah. I have a deep connection with Rachel. Well, it, it really felt. Oh. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I, that's right. I said that. I said it. <laughs> yeah. Are you the wizard? I would I would watch Constantine <laughs> ten thousand times in a row. Really, of, of all the of all the Rachel films, that's the one you're going to pick. <laughs> the that is a weird bloom. choice. <laughs> I was waiting the for that. Brothers not bloom. not oh. Constant Gardner. Not yeah, all, uh... all of those. All of those are fantastic. You're, you're <laughs> absolutely right. It, it, as long as you're going to bring up the Brothers Bloom, that's a high on my list. But Andy won't talk about it. I've never seen it. <laughs> yeah. All right, moving. On. All right, moving on. So go ahead, Steve. You you're back. Uh, yeah, sorry, we had a little incident. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. We are we moving well, on to character? No, out? actually, wait a minute. Tom it... Tom was about to talk about how uh, was about to respond to me. Tom, okay, respond to me. You owe me this. Yes. What What was I responding to exactly? Well, we were talking about the about the, about the blandness of the witches and the role that they play in the sort of dramatic arc of the story. Uh, part of that. Yeah, I mean, they had, one of them wanted the kingdom, which I get. Uh, one of them had boy troubles. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I felt like they <laughs> they took away so much, for, again, to use your phrase, people that can shoot sparks and flame out of their hands. It just took a boy to destroy all of their power and to have them just become embittered and fighting amongst each other, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, you just said, I mean, he showed up or just when he showed up, I'm sorry, you just, you just said it for me. I mean that you just, I think boiled down the entire thing that all it took was a boy for everything to fall apart. And that was 
I mean, this could very well have been an episode of Frenemy. Uh, of you know, no, no, no. It's not a boy. It was it was their belief in the prophecy that caused the problem. It wasn't a boy that caused the problem. It's all of them in their belief in this prophecy that caused no, the problem. It goes back to that. It, it goes back to that was, whole theme of, of of believing in something, which was stated, I think, directly at least four times in the film. And I was like, really, do we need to say it again? That if you believe enough in something, and it is, it's yeah. Like they all believe enough in that. That that's what causes the problem. Well, and that's, that's uh, we that's talked about what, that. But that's not what causes the love problems. It's the dancing and the music box. I mean, that's. I mean, let's let's really look at it. This she'd could have never, been a documentary. She'd never danced before. She'd never been given a gift before. She'd never been, you know, whatever. Nobody's ever done that for me before. I mean, it wasn't just a prophecy. It was this this schlub coming along and saying all the right things to a woman who's who's never met a schlub before. And then the same thing <laughs> happened with Rachel Y. She shows up and she's a yes. she's all she gets all like you know, hot and bothered when she walks in. She's, oh, I like him. I like him. I, yeah. I just I, you know, and Michelle Williams, of course, she comes along, and it's like electricity, and suddenly everybody's everybody's well, in because, love with Franco. That's because we saw her. We we knew that that was yeah. right because we saw her back in right. in, in the uh, gingham, in Kansas. No, in Kansas. The, in gingham, she was wearing gingham. Oh, in gingham. I thought you said in the kingdom. Right? No, in gingham. Uh, and so, so I, I think I think it's the schlub. I mean, we have the prophecy that's the high-level reason the film falls apart, but it's the schlub that they just layered on top of that. And maybe had they gotten rid of all the goo-goo eyes and the, the you know, uh, Rachel Wise, Wise sort of hound dog character, we've, we, we may have been able to believe more in the prophecy well, part. Well, I, I had a problem, though, with the fact that there's these flying monkeys that everybody's afraid of, yet nobody notices that they're all flying out of Emerald City. It's like... Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, who's who's running this show here? Why are they come? Why are they here? Flying out of the tower? Uh, it's like nobody notices that. I don't know. <laughs> and then they all get an invitation to a party at Emerald City, and they all think, "Let's go." Yeah, right. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, okay, I feel like we've derailed uh, Steve so many times. Uh, go blah, ahead, blah, please blah. share your. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, because what I thought, what I thought, might be, you guys are already into the witches, so I thought we could, if we tackle them one at a time, because there were some interesting things about each of them that that I think is yes, I'm going to come out. Yes, there's all kinds of flaws. You know, Theodora, okay, first witch we meet. The issue I have is, we, I mean, can, when, there's when just when not enough background. The witches, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, can we say the name of the witch, but then the character that played them? I'm terrible okay. with proper names. Yeah. Oh, sure. Theodora, she's, you know, Mila Kunis, the, you know, becomes the evil, Got the it. wicked witch. The wicked witch. So, the, yeah, so she's the first one we meet. And I think the one of the biggest problems I have with with all of this is here we're, we've got a prequel and everything's hinging on all these the events that happened prior to Oscar getting there. You know, the, the king died, there's all this stuff, and we don't really have enough understanding or get enough information about what was going on. So Theodora, she's a witch. Her sister, you know, we don't know. She just sort of shows up. We don't know what power she has. Apparently she's, you know, was born right before she met him because we, there's no background to her, who she is, what she does, which side she's playing in this. She has like one line where she says, I just want everything to be balanced or something to that effect. She just wants everything to be okay. She's just really bland. And I thought there's a problem there with this character that we know is going to be, you know, transformed into this, you know, iconic figure. And I just didn't have a strong enough sense of, you know, where she was coming from. You know, which, you know, I, I still, aside from the two being sisters, I don't know how they're all related to each other at all, because they're supposed, and as we, we were coming out, my wife said to me, so where's the fourth witch? Because isn't there one for each direction? So is there a fourth one that we didn't yeah. see? Are they there saving was... her for a sequel? Because it, it was a whole discussion about, you know, who, who they are, how they're, are they all sisters or not? Because Glinda is the daughter of the king, but who are the other two are they other sisters or and that was really unclear and i think added to some of the problems i have with what they were doing and what their motives were for doing certain things yeah east is and west part of the are evil north and south are good good yeah and as i recall i mean my only just like in america just like in america <laughs> my only wait what 
That's okay. awesome. <laughs> I, I think I'm there sorry. was a good North uh, Witch of the North in the Wicked book, but I really can't remember. Yeah. So I don't remember if there was, uh, if North existed. But yeah, I, I was curious about that too. I'm like, why aren't we seeing the Good Witch of the North? Right. You know, you know the problem for me is it, we we have already seen in the first in the the original film that the the you know the bad witch had devoted her life to terrorizing the land of Oz. One of the bad witches. Where one of the bad right. witches, right? It devoted her life to terrorizing the land of Oz, and uh, we had given it up. <laughs> hear, hear me say this out loud: we'd given it over to Faith that there was enough reason for her to do that. Uh, that huh. she was just bad. And right. in so many ways, what this movie did, what Oz the Great and Powerful does, is deflate everything that we had previously given up to faith for the it, in exchange for a good story like the value proposition was originally was there uh that it was a it was a good sort of now as tom says it's the untouchable um it's it was enough for us and now they've just deflated that by making making the origin story not as powerful and so do you is it the same with the same logic then apply to Darth Vader who was who shows up in Star Wars is this iconic evil character who's just terrorizing the galaxy just because, and then we get these really crappy origin stories for him. Does that deflate his power? Does that logic apply uh, as well? Just to some extent. I mean, I think you know, I'm I'm had already. <laughs> I, I guess I had discounted the prequels enough. Uh, on their <laughs> their dramatic impact that I'm still able to watch sort of the the entrance of the empire on the on the you know scout ship in the beginning and yeah. I'm able to let that go because he's he's pretty scary and he's you know but but okay. but I think this the same logic does apply when you screw up these iconic stories mm -hmm. uh by making dumb prequels um you know there's <laughs> that's that's the risk and they they yeah. that you take well, but the thing that's and the thing that's frustrating to me is that they already had an amazing prequel in Wicked. The, yes. I mean, the book, and I ha haven't seen the musical that was uh, based on the book, but that book was fantastic, and it really dealt with the witch and why she became wicked, and her and her relationship with Glinda, and you know, kind of the wizard and and Dorothy were a peripheral story that you saw here and there, but really it was about her and Glinda, and I, I enjoyed that so much more than what they did here, and I I don't know why they felt like they had to, they they just had to completely create a whole new prequel, but this prequel just does not work for me nearly as well as Wicked does. Well, I I think this one is a um, I think this one is a rights issue, right? They're they're it's because they are making the movie, uh, yeah. of Wicked, and it's coming in twenty thousand or twenty thousand fourteen, so it'll be a while. <laughs> wow! Uh, and I think Stephen Dald <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Stephen Daldry twenty thousand fourteen. Oh my. Yeah. He's still yeah. gonna be alive. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> I the knew production. He was a robot. <laughs> production time is oh. is very very long. Um, wow. Stephen Daldry to direct, and uh, he did uh, Billy Elliot and uh, The Hours and Extremely Loud yeah. and Incredibly Close. So, so that movie is coming. That was like a rights it's... issue. This to <laughs> this this to me is a is a is an example of Disney needing to uh, bolster uh, some. Uh, you know, finding some uh, property that they can execute on quickly before what is bound to be a freight train yeah. of publicity comes in wicked. Right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the movie's called Oz, you know, I mean, that's so I'm expecting his origin. I, to me, it wasn't necessary to to weave in the origin of, you know, the Wicked Witch, because he could have shown up on the scene and she was already there, you know, yeah. in that, you know, and it's a story of him. You know, so I agree with Andy. It's like there's already a well-known origin story for this character out there. Now you're, you're going to throw a competing story out there that's just not not as strong. Yeah, it's going to it's going to weaken the film. I the, the one thing about the Wicked Witch that I thought was interesting was, you know, the the, the crying and the scars on the face. OK, that was, was cool. It was cool. And then, but then, you know, as soon as she turns all green, my wife leans over and says, well, she she would be a lot scarier if she kept those scars. Why'd those go away? That would have been such a cool thing to keep on that character. Right. I'm like, 
yeah, it would have had, you know, here, here's the scars, the pain that's, you know, vis visible on her face. And to have that carry through with that character would have been great. And it's like, no, they just, you know, put a pointed nose and chin on her and the, the hat. And OK, there she goes. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, so uh, and then was, Rachel like, and then, a Rachel Wise. Yeah. Uh, now, then, th that's a character that, again, it's like suffering from like Jafar syndrome. I'm the evil advisor to the king who's going to try to kill off the king and take over. Why? She's just evil because she's evil. I didn't get a strong sense of her motives other than, ha, 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 I'm evil and I want to control everything, but f to what end? Yeah, I, you know, I felt exactly the same way as we've, we've devoted so much time to uh, the backstory of Theodora the Green, and we have nothing uh, about, uh, you know, the evil of Evanora, uh, Evanora the Whites. What? Did they say why she hate? <laughs> did they, did they, <laughs> I don't. I don't remember. Did they say why she's so against um, Michelle Williams? I have no recollection. No, of that, but other I think than I, other than she's sleeping. just the wicked witch. She's secretly, right. you know, is the wicked witch. She's, she's the one the who wicked. killed. She's the one who killed the king because yeah, apparently she wanted to rule. I, you know, they never really clarified that. Right and. And then the question I have is, once she loses her little power amulet or whatever, why does she turn into an old hag? Because it's a Sam Raimi movie. <laughs> well, yeah, that was the thing. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she transformed herself to look younger. Yeah, no, no there's something, that before, there's something or... about that emerald jewel, right, that keeps yeah. her youthful, and what is that? So, again, we have a lot of yeah. backstory on this clumsy teenage rage, uh, rage-filled Theodora, Theodora, and we have no backstory when it really yeah. counts, like when we right. really need it. Yes. Right. Yeah. Makes me mad. Okay. No. It seems like so, it seems like all that stuff must have gotten cut out, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that would have been made... The story so much more interesting is to really focus on, you know, this whole confrontation between Oz and, and Evanora, I think would, you know, that whole power struggle, the good versus evil there would have been really, you know, something of interest to me to really see with a deeper understanding of what she was trying, what she's trying to accomplish. Right. Yeah. That's well, that's and, and why. Yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah. a really great comment because it's almost like the story they told is peripheral to the story we wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. her relationship with her sister in yes. the nature in the nature of evil I thought was would have been a lot more interesting as well because mm -hmm. her sister seemed tricked into evil whereas oh, yes. she essentially was evil, but then right. her sister all of a sudden was like the evilest and it's like I, I don't know. It just it, yeah. it felt like there needed to be a lot more developed there to really make something interesting. Oh, I, I totally agree. It's like, okay, Theodora gets betrayed by feels betrayed by Oz, turns to her sister. Oh my gosh, sister, you're you're really the wicked one. Oh yeah, here, eat this apple. And then it's like, oh, I'm okay with you being evil now that I'm evil, so it's okay. But I'm still gonna hold this grudge against Oz and and torment the citizens of of the of you know because of that. But I'm okay with the fact that my sister's been lying to me this this whole time, and that's okay. That just made no sense to me. And it, she's it, gonna break the rule in Oz that no one can kill anyone. Yeah. Yes, and <laughs> uh, totally out eviling the evilist. Right. Oh, okay. you guys are making really good points. I'm liking this movie less after we're talking, <laughs> to be honest. Still, but, okay, like, I but, didn't even come up with those. I, I felt like this uneasiness with a lot of the plot, but you yeah. guys are putting it into much better yeah. words or any words than I, when I had not. That's I was but, just uh, sort of like, screw you, James Franco. <laughs> but I can set it aside and enjoy it because I, I will say, to me, Glinda was was i that was a witch i enjoyed more for some reason whenever i saw her i'm like she's gandalf she is gandalf she is so wise she can see into she can see into oz there was this sort of like tragic hope that she had because she knows this isn't the guy that we need but he's the guy we've got it's sort of like you know frodo it's like he's the hero we've got not the hero we really need to take this thing on and there were just so many things in that character of glinda that just reminded me of gandalf she's got this power she doesn't like to you know show it off all the time she sort of plays in the background to kind of push the hero forward to encourage him on his way and to me 
she was a much more interesting character than the other two witches. And there was, I didn't feel a lack of background to her, although I still don't know that much about her, her relationship to the king, why she's slinking around a graveyard in a black cape or, or anything like that. But there was more to her. And I maybe I was just a little bit more forgiving of that character because I could make this connection to what she was doing as part of the plot. But she's Gandalf. Yeah. Hmm. Man, I Yeah, that makes sense. I get yeah. I guess and at the end, you know, there's the, the lightning fight. Thou shalt <laughs> thou shalt not pass. That's right. I like Gand <laughs> I like I, I like Gandalf an awful lot for me to agree with you a hundred percent. Okay. I mean, I'll give you maybe sixty. Okay, I'll take that. I I feel like a high sixty is good. How about how about seventy? Can I get you the no, seventy? No, I can't. I, I can't I do that. I can't. <laughs> Not in good. Conscience. I do like the idea though uh, about what Steve was saying about um, when I already said, and we'll get to Mr. Franco at some point. But the uh, how unsafe I felt in his hands as an actor. So we honest. should yeah. we should go ahead and get to him, and now. then also yeah. as a as a as a character but then i did like kind of like gandalf there's this feeling of it's not like you know everything's going to work out necessarily but there's one person that really believes that it's all going to work out and that sort of gives you this solace and this kind of okayness uh for the film and i thought she did do that for me well, I think that's but now I'm I'm starting to bridge character and actor now. So. Well, and you know, here's the thing though for that because here you have the you're right. We absolutely I think need this it, she her role is very functional, right? Like dramatically you're right. We need someone as a tent pole in this film that believes it's going to be okay, that gives the the uh, that that sort of gives the energy and faith to our protagonist to actually, you know, overcome the great barriers that that he needs to overcome. Um but uh, at the same time, this is a movie that's so convoluted about the issue of faith and what we believe in that I almost feel unsafe with her, uh, you know, her belief in Oz. Mm, right. Right. It's like right. They, they sort of betray my faith in her role as that sort of functional leader of the faith. Um, I, I Fair I, enough. That makes sense. Uh, so and he on, actually, James Franco's character makes a leap, a physical leap of faith pretty soon after meeting her right yeah he jumps off he jumps off the cliff i guess it's not that soon after he meets her but before he turns into a bubble yes. with everybody he yeah, literally yeah. makes a leap of faith. a leap of faith yeah 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 following For her. her yep right okay all right I just like to say everything out loud. When it, when it comes <laughs> my head. I'm sorry. I have no actual thoughts or well, feelings. I just like to say what I come up with. <laughs> okay, so so James Franco. Uh, uh, do we have anything else to really say about James Franco? What other? Thing? Well, I, I mean, the thing with I, the issue I have with his, his character is that I just where was his that that pivotal point where he goes where he he starts to believe in himself that he can really do this, and it was if. It, if it happened when he's like, yes, Thomas Edison and the the whole like, you know, we're going to build all this stuff. I was, if that was supposed to be the transition of like, yes, he's finally believing in himself. Then to me, it was totally undercut by the, oh, I'm loading up all this gold in my balloon and everybody thinks I'm leaving and it's part of the plan. But we don't know that. And I'm like, because well, I could totally buy into the fact that, no, he's still the con man. He wants to get out of here and that it wasn't part of his plan that it was just, I'm going to try and escape and, you know, something's going to go wrong and he's going to be forced to deal with it. I never had the sense of, oh, this is a decoy thing because this is what they would expect me to do. I'm watching that going, Crap, he's going to try to escape and he's going to get shot down and he's going to have to deal with this. But I, cause I didn't, <laughs> I didn't believe his, his transformation to, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to really say it because I've never had a, the faith that anything that's coming out of his mouth, he really believes and is being truthful right. with anyone. Well, and that's, it seemed that's, to happen off screen. Right. <laughs> that, well, that's exactly <laughs> it. His whole transformation did happen off screen and it was hidden from us, the audience, because we were supposed to be as amazed and surprised by his reappearance as yeah. all of the citizens of Oz. And it was a big letdown because we don't get to see him transform really. Yeah. Right. I totally wanted him to leave on the balloon. <laughs> I wanted him to get away and like, 
full so on. So you thought you this know. was going to be like a Star Trek prequel where they're going to like change everything. And so then it's like, <laughs> yeah. no, he, he really escaped. And so all those other movies, all those stories afterwards, yeah, they're a different timeline. I, no, a different I wanted, this is what uh-huh. I wanted. I wanted the balloon. We get the, we get the wide shot of the audio of the crowd. The balloon goes up into the sky and we get a slow fade. And it's just, and that's it. And then it comes back up and he's got his feet up and he actually is living in the Bronx and it's 1976. And he lives in this fantastic condo and he's wearing, you know, some big old bell bottom pants. And that's James Franco. And and he's actually going by the name James Franco. That's how I wanted it to end. And he's got a little spliff that he's uh, he's smoking. (laughs) Great, that's, that's a great that's James Franco. This is the greatest trick the devil ever pulled, right? I mean, this is he just he got the gold and moved to yeah. the Bronx. All right, uh, did not it didn't it overall didn't work, and I think after this conversation, it works even uh, less. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> Uh, okay, that, so that so I, I I have a note here. I have a note. I've got got some feedback from the rest of the household. Um, storming in. It actually came storming came in when s- they when they heard heard me ranting about about <laughs> us that that he nice. could not let some people know so that their reactions would be authentic, and that it was always part of his plan. But he had they had to believe that he had left so that their reactions would be authentic. The witches would buy into it. And but all no one that. was talk, but no one was talking to them. I like that <laughs> idea. But yeah. no one was talking to Nook, Nook, uh, Nook, yeah. Nook. Yeah. No one was yeah. talking yeah. to, to Monkey Magoo. Her. Like there was yeah. no <laughs> yeah. reaction, or there was no communication from the, between the evil what? witches and anyone else. Right. Right. Bring Especially it on. Bring it on, let alone lady I hear in the background. Let Bring alone, it on. <laughs> let alone Master Tinker, who helped him build the balloon. Right. We knew all along <laughs> that it was all a, a ruse. Exactly. Does it it just didn't it didn't fly. And and with that, I think we've actually knocked Steve offline. Oh, uh, did, uh, did I do uh, that? I'm there sorry. was such uh, there was such the vitriol. The vitriol, the, uh, the is such an acerbic. That response. being said that while all of that though, I do want to say that while that was so clunky and weird and I didn't know how I was supposed to feel, and I clearly didn't feel like how the movie thought I was supposed to feel, that the segment when the smoke and everything comes up and his uh yeah. uh face is projected on from the old um what are those called? Pictriola, whatever those things are. Yeah, yeah. I got a real charge from that. I thought that was really fun. That was back to the magic. Yeah. I just, I guess, I kept wanting like the machinations of the plot to get out of the way. Yeah. yeah, Absolutely. Because there was so much magic in it. Absolutely. It was, it was, it was really seriously full of that, that kind of magic. And that's when that final sequence, uh, you know, paid off for me from that moment when his face comes up in the clouds and we are taken. I, you know, I loved the, the monkey, um, you know, shooting the, the fireworks through, through his, his mouth. mouth. That That's was great. so cool. That was fantastic. Uh, so yeah. th- there was, there was a lot of that, that, that I think ended up working, um, you know, ended up working really well. And, um, still, uh, you know, I think you're right. It's it's at that point when the energy picks up and the effects pick up, and you're you you kind of are able to forget the last, um, you know, hour and forty minutes, uh, right? And, <laughs> and you can just be a part of the spectacle again. And I think the, I think the biggest real. I know I know we've said it over and over again, but and I don't. You know, I know he's. I'm sure he's a good guy. I'm sure he doesn't listen to this. Why am I doing that, um, Mr. Franco? Please don't uh, come I to my that, house. I think that it lit. I think the film is in his hands and it was just wrong hands that if you put someone like a Robert Downey Jr. in there, then you could understand the, he could pull off the lover of women and the sly con man, all of those elements. And then the sensitive kind of like, Oh, I don't really know what I'm doing kind of a thing. He's been doing that with uh, all the Iron Man films, but with James Franco, you just sort of feel like someone just sort of pretending to be all of these things and not in a meta way of like, Oh, pretending to be a con man because the con man has to be the epitome of confidence and everything. And I felt so nervous whenever it was time for like a comedy take like when yeah. someone would say to him, hey, you'll do this, and he makes this weird face, and then 
then gets to like, I don't know what I'm doing. And it was just, I just felt like he was just <laughs> the worst choice. Well, and you Not know, to your point, choice, it's, it, it seems like that roller coaster of confidence in, in his portrayal of the con man is not, you're, you, I mean, you're, I think you're spot on that he does, that, that we, we are not able to ever join him in the momentum of confidence uh, because he never really succeeds at it enough for us to believe that that he is really this you know great con man or up close magician like we we're never quite there he's always uh just a little bit off mm-hmm. um and and so i yeah i think we just sort of lose that but i yeah. loved i loved you in 127 uh, hours thank you no, oh, me to or... him no to him oh cuz i was also in, in that case movie. he's listening you, you were also in that movie I played the rock. rock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we both made the same that joke is, at the same is. time. <laughs> like mine. I played I played the second hour. <laughs> okay, <done. laughs> Doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, any last uh, this is a, I'm, I want to wrap it up here. We've been uh, I think we've given this movie way more than it deserves potentially. Uh, but I'd like to uh, get some closing comments on Sam Raimi. Mm. You know uh, I, Yes. Go ahead. You first. No, you first. no, what I was about to say was I wish someone would go first other than me. <laughs> okay. I I didn't feel like it was a Sam Raimi film except for those moments where you've got those crazy like crash zoom and Dutch tilt at the same time sorts of things in people's <laughs> faces as things were happening. And then the crazy transformation of Rachel Weiss at the end when she turns into the, the lady from uh, – uh, uh, drag me to hell. Drag me to hell. <laughs> to hell I, I exactly. Turned to the gypsy lady and moved yeah. off to uh, to the city to torment poor uh, what's her name. So uh, for me, Jessica Tandy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, so so no, it's it's that girl. She Jessica. She's Jessica Lang's younger version in Big Fish. Oh, whatever. Uh, uh, Allison uh, Lohman. Uh, Allison yes. Lohman. Tormenting Allison Lohman in, in Drag Me to Hell. Right. Uh. So uh, other than that, it didn't really strike me as a Sam Raimi film other than those moments. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I prefer going back to other Sam Raimi films rather than this one, I think. See, so, yeah, now you bring up Sam Raimi, you, and I'm going to connect this back to a, another Sam Raimi film that uh, I know Pete's going to love because it's got Kevin Costner in it. Oh, snap. (laughs) (laughs) But it's, it's, you know, Sam Raimi will do these films and for love of the game was a baseball film with Kevin Costner that, you know, did had a few visual effects that were kind of really neat getting in the, in the pitcher's mind. But other than that, it was just this very straightforward narrative drama about this, this character. And to me, that's, that's what I got here. There were a few of these very visually, you know, these these great moments and the rest of it is, oh, here's these characters moving through the story. So there wasn't a whole lot where I felt, you know, oh, this is, you know, a, a, a trademark Sam Raimi film. But it, to me, it's it's his ability to say, well, I need to step back and not let my visual style become a distraction from the story because there is a lot of it, it can become overwhelming. Uh, and so I think this was a case where he showed a little bit of restraint it, to to let the story try to step forward. Um, and I think trying to be a little bit delicate, knowing that this is, uh, you know, one of these you know properties that's going to have a lot of eyes on it because of it's a prequel to The Wizard of Oz. So I think he was, you know, ha- out of respect to the, f- the franchise and to Disney that he tried to, you know, do his best with that. And I. I yeah, I, I think you know overall the the flaws we've identified are, are script issues. Uh, so I, I I don't don't blame Mr. Ramey for anything you know wrong with this film. It's this was the script that he was given. They do the best he can, and you know despite those flaws, as a family film, I you know I still think this is a good enjoyable film that I think my kids will enjoy watching over and over again because they can look past some of those those flaws they're willing to to believe and well and, well, and, move and for kids for kids over what age because I it's definitely not for six-year-olds 
No, my my mine are uh, ten and twelve, and they they both enjoyed it. And I I agree, and even the ten year old would last because we saw it at like a seven thirty show last night. By the time we got home, she was like, uh, maybe we shouldn't have seen this so late at night because that witch at the end she was kind of scary. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so so maybe eleven and twelve year olds or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, she she did all right. I mean, she's you know not overly traumatized that that yeah. i'm aware of but it was you know she you know it's those, it, it, <laughs> when you were that age there were movies you saw like come on we were talking about poltergeist you know yeah. those scary intense movies you know it's you you love that thrill of being scared but there's still enough fun in this film to sort of balance it out um and i know you guys as a family have already bought tickets to evil dead so <laughs> um and steve i'm interested do you think he do you think he treated um the oz franchise for disney with more or less respect than he treated the the uh spider-man property well you got to look at spider-man 3 and go what spider-man 3 this? yeah i mean that sort of was an emo kind of music video like i, I but but in general but, like uh, yeah. spider-man the original uh the or the first uh yeah. i i quite enjoyed Oh yeah, no. I those were the first. You know, the first, first two, two were yeah. Yeah. Our, our 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 great films, and that's what you know. One of those things where it's it's really interesting to look at. You know, look at his filmography and look at you know you've got Evil Dead and Army of Darkness, and then you know in there you got Dark Man, and it's this you know this very different from you know simple, this transition simple to simple plan for the love of the game right. Plan, right yeah yeah you know but it's, it, it's okay he had a very he he had a very specific style that he was sort of getting identified with and broke out into that and become very successful in a lot of these other projects so I, i'm very excited to see where he's going next as a filmmaker what what he's going to be allowed to do. i i hope that this is not a black mark on his record that's going to say, oh, gosh, you know, this this movie didn't do as well as everyone had hoped and, you know, sort of reining him back. But, you know, then right, maybe he's going down the Soderbergh route of like little, you know, going back to his origins with things like Drag Me to Hell and then balance that out with a with an Oz film. He'll maybe he'll play both sides of that, of the, the big films and then, you know, smaller back to his roots, you know, horror type yeah. Type pieces every once in a while, which would be nice. Just it would be, to get that from him. I would certainly like that. You just you bring up a point that gets me thinking. Like it just feels uh, that there are this movie feels like Sam Raimi, and yet it feels like uh, as you say, like you 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 deal with what you're given, and this was the script he was given. Like he either had or took more ownership. Like there was more Sam Raimi ness to the Spider Man uh, properties, yeah, um, than than there was here. And and I think I walked away from this film. Uh, sort of wishing for more Sam Raiminess. Uh, oh yeah, and and so. I, you know, even even with Bruce Campbell, uh, it was not Sam Raimi <laughs> enough. No, oh, that's right. Is the palace guard? Yeah, getting yeah, just whacked right. in the head over and over right. again. That was brilliant. That was funny. Uh, so and the, and yeah. we didn't get an opportunity to see the car. So you know, no, <laughs> no, it wouldn't have fit. But no. still, that's true. That um, <laughs> would have been brilliant. He could work that in. If he I know, you, have, you, have, you have to look up the DVD to see if it's flying around in the twister there, you know, with all the debris. Oh, if they I'm threw sure, it sure it is. That's I'm sure there brilliant. was some mention to it or something, oh. or even some sort of, like, name or something like that. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. Well, he, he I'm uh, sure, figured it in somehow. I'm sure. And by the way, he is slated to be the producer on the Poltergeist remake. <laughs> oh. Yes, that indeed. makes me feel better. Yes. I don't know if that makes me feel better. It makes me feel sad for Sam. <laughs> yeah. No. <sighs> no, but I like someone that's uh that has the kind of sensibility of that to be in charge or at least to be looking over people's shoulders versus just like Michael Bay with Platinum <laughs> Dunes just sort of like just being like, "Hey, we can remake this. Let's do it." Woo! <laughs> More robots. <laughs> That's yeah, how I that's assume true. Michael Bay hopefully talks. They'll, hopefully they'll do something good. <laughs> that's, a, that's good. That's good. Uh, not bad, right? Funny. I do. I do uh, voices. Not too bad. That was brilliant. Bad. All right, gentlemen. Uh, I this is uh, how fantastic. dare you? You did yeah. not ask for my final thoughts about. Oh, Raby. yeah. No, I'm sorry. That was horrible. <laughs> no, it's okay. But I'll make it super, super. No, quick. you don't even need to. You take your time. Whatever time you need, we'll we'll wait. All Go right. Ahead. Three Any, days later. Anytime. It's, it started when I was born in August 10th, 1970. <laughs> no, the uh, the one thing that I would say is that I do believe this is now the third film that I've seen. Nope, fourth film, I'm sorry. Three that I liked uh, after Hugo, 
uh, Life of Pi, and then this, when I do believe that 3D, when in the hands of an actual real filmmaker who loves it and knows and films it in 3D and does all this stuff, that it is a viable and really exciting medium. That it doesn't just make things frenetic. It doesn't make things crazy. I never thought I'd be saying this. But now after Life of Pi and Hugo and seeing this, 3D really brought another <laughs> I was about to say another dimension <laughs> I knew it really. oh, yeah. I was on but the edge was, of my seat for that uh, it brought uh, it brought another it just heightened the experience so much that I think that it really can exist uh unfortunately it just has to be uh handled by people that really care about it and know what they're doing yeah. I couldn't imagine seeing Life of Pi not in 3D because it was so exciting to me in right. 3D Definitely. Well, and there are, I think that's a really good point. And I, it, it does make me wish I'd, I'd seen this movie in 3D based on that, that glowing review. Uh, also, I own 3D. <laughs> <laughs> Discl full disclosure. Uh, you know, I think back to Avatar, uh, which blew me away. The 3D and that just blew yep. me away. And uh, Prometheus. Yeah. And I, I mean, there are just these experiences that really are experiences. And they're worth the extra money. They're worth... Um, they're worth seeing it in 3D, and then I just feel like it's still we're in a, a we're in an age where this transition, it, it's still pretty easy to get burned, uh, yes. on dumb, dumb, stupid, dumb 3D, and and this one, uh, airbendered, I think is the term. yeah yeah there you go <laughs> yeah oh, nice oh that was well done we have to add that to the list <laughs> uh, okay are we finished do we have any other one more things is that I it? Don't. All right. Let me we need let to me, uh, let me check this slide fifty four of my PowerPoint please. to see what <laughs> we uh, do. We do need to come to some collective agreement as we flick chart. Oh this no, baby! Yeah, this is going to be good. All I'm right, very ready, excited ready, about this. Ready, everybody? Oh, right. What is this yeah. again? We're putting films against films. Films against films. You can okay. Yeah, it, you're right. Right. Uh, Tom, match, right? Tom, if you go to uh, flickchart.com slash the next reel. Flick, oh, flickchart.com slash the next reel. I do not have a computer, but I look forward to doing that at some point. And here we go. Oz the Great and Powerful or Looper? <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> Boat trip or Schindler's List? <laughs> <laughs> looper. Oh, that was awesome. Uh, yeah, Looper for me. Yeah, looper. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll go with Looper. <laughs> All right. that, that seems less like a question and more like some weird <laughs> trap. <laughs> you have chosen poorly. <laughs> oh. All right, Oz the Great and Powerful or the Parallax View? Parallax View. Parallax Ooh, View. Parallax View. Mm. But have... yeah, Parallax View. Just for that one sequence alone. Yeah, that's right. Steve? Have not seen Parallax View. Oh, oh. all right. Well I know, I know. You've got you got some catching up to do. I do. Oz the Great and Powerful or Major League? Major League. <laughs> Major League. Yes, that's a classic. <laughs> Tom, Tom's not Tom. speaking. I'm worried. Because he's got a thing with sports movies, as I recall. Yeah. Um, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Major come on. You've Major already League. lost, Major right? Major League. Okay. All right. There you go. You can be honest. But have we, has, has anyone ever talked about the that Major League literally rips off the entire script of Bull Durham? Or is that like a joke that everyone knows? It, it well, it really, it literally doesn't. So it's probably just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but like all the beats, they do. Okay, never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm interested in that at some point because we did Bull Durham and Major League in the same series uh, on this show a while back. They hit almost so many of the same beats that at times Major League seems like a naked gun of Bull Durham, which probably uh, I, was what the point. <laughs> was the probably point. the point. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Oz the Great and Powerful or Alien Resurrection? <laughs> Which, Which one is that? Is that Alien out. 4? Yeah, it's Alien 4. No, I got to go with Oz on that oh, one because that, no. that re Alien Res... No, even though it's got aliens in it, that was just... It, uh, uh, I, I can watch Oz again and enjoy it. I, I saw Alien Resurrection once and I just have no desire to ever see that again. I, I'm oh. gonna. I can't watch Oz again and, and enjoy it. I, 
I can't watch Alien again and enjoy it, but it does at least have a couple sequences I, I do like. So. <laughs> so you just want the power to go out. But, <laughs> so you don't have to watch either of these. Don't make it's me like, choose. Which um, is going to make me die. Uh, you want quicker. revolution? This is Tommy. I will say uh, Alien Resurrection because although it's kind of a mess of a film, it has such great ideas in some of it, and I don't think that Oz did. Yeah. Oh. Punch in Our the face. Feet. Kick in the groin. Okay. Uh, I'm, I am also going to go Alien, alien Resurrection, uh, if, if, you know, because um, of the swimming scene. There you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That must have been terrifying to film. Can't, can't hold my breath that long. I love that. Yeah. All right. Uh, Oz the Great and Powerful or Strange Days? Oh. Oh, man. Mm. I'm going Strange Days only because of all the POV camera work in that. Anytime they put the things on and you're watching the actual like first person POV in like single shots, I thought that stuff was great. The rest of the movie I can I can do without, but I really enjoy that opening 15 or like, however many, five minutes. Yeah, that was, I, a, that was an epic five minutes, no doubt. Do you guys remember the trailer for that movie? If I'm nerding oh, out and no one no, knows the trailer. About it. Oh yeah, that's, no, it's... that's that's the other reason to vote for Strange Days because yeah. it's one of the best teaser trailers ever. Oh that's my true. god, yeah. you I love just... her. I'm your priest. Oh, so great. I love that trailer. Sorry, <laughs> I'm so drunk. Go ahead. Let's just. I mean, I I just want to kind of r- relate the fact that Strange Days is the second worst film we have ever done behind Rush. Yeah. yeah. Ahead of Rush. I mean that, like. Besides that opening and the trailer, there's not a lot redeeming about Strange Days. No, there's not. I'm I I'm gonna go Oz a Great and Powerful on this one. I can't I Okay. Are we tied? I don't know. <sighs> I... So we've got two Oz's and we're waiting for Steve. Do you two have two Oz's? Tra- two Oz's. Well, I, Tom, you just said me too, right? Yes, sir. So that's two Oz's. I said Strange Days. Steve? Yeah, I have to go with Oz because right. I just yeah. All right, three Oz's. Oz takes it. Woo-hoo. Oz Except... the Great and Powerful or the Fifth Element? <laughs> oh. <laughs> fifth Element. Fifth Element is just ridiculous fun, so I have to give it that. It's ridiculous, and I'll give it that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, but I'm gonna... I, but I, I would put it on over Oz, so I'll pick yeah. it too. Uh, now that it matters, I'm going to go Oz. Okay. Oh. Oh, <laughs> I hate elements. I Character know. judgment. I do, I do too. Mm. It's a terrible film. All right, we're done. It's okay. it's number seventy five out of seventy seven. Okay. On our list. Man, all right. That's you gotta, pick, you gotta pick some better uh, film board movies. To what talk. is going on with this? We we are just on a terrible stretch. All right. So what is what is our next uh, uh, opportunity? We have a, a list. No, we've uh, got an April movie, don't we already? Is that forty uh, two? Yeah. 42 is, is yeah. going to be our April movie. Oh, Wait, are, we, are we still being recorded or are we just talking to each we're, other? We're being recorded. This is live and we're oh, about we to are. we're about to end it. But I think I, I think what we're going to be doing on the next one is, is 42. That might change because of Tom and his thing about hating sports movies and, or, or loving sports movies. I can't remember. And? And, and what else? <laughs> you a bitter old man? No, never mind. I forgot that we were still recording. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good. All right. Uh, so uh, for everybody who's put on, this has been a, a uh, an epic show on a movie that, as I said, likely didn't didn't quite deserve it. Uh, an hour and a half. Well done, gentlemen. All right. Um, and America! so thanks, thanks everybody for listening live. Uh, and uh, uh, make sure to check out the website, thenextreel.com slash contact. And then you won't have to put up with us talking about all of our various places. You go to contact, you can do whatever you want. Call us, Facebook us, whatever you want. Uh, thenextreel.com slash contact and uh, we will see you uh, online and oh I should say to all of our new listeners we've had a, a nice spike in new Facebook uh, uh, friends this uh, over the last week or so oh, wow. uh, welcome to uh, The Next Reel thanks for listening to The Film Board and uh, join us for our regularly scheduled show every Thursday 8.30 Pacific time thanks everybody thanks for joining us gents we'll see you next time <laughs>